I'm Ian Phillips, I'm from Arm, and uh, my job is a un fairly unusual one. I'm, I'm there to, to look after technology which doesn't have definable business and, uh, and yet might turn out to be uh, strategically important to the company. Uh, so here I'm, I'm doing something of a, a look at energy efficient computing, not just from a, uh, let's say, a traditional viewpoint, but also looking at it perhaps more specifically from uh, what it means in an ARM context, because, uh, of course, as you know, ARM is... Uh, uh, let's say close to my heart, it's close to lots of your hearts, so you possibly don't realise it yet. We'll see. Um, so I, I've got to start and, and look at just what energy efficient computing might mean, and, and of course the through the looking glass bit is let's look at ourselves, because these are, uh, this is the world that we're in, and if energy efficient computing is going to be a part of it, then uh, this, is, this is the world that it is part of. There's seven billion of us, and increasingly the, our mission in life seems to be fun, celebrity and leisure, rather than work or anything like that. Um, but Behind all of that fun celebrity and work, we now start to see electronic systems everywhere. And here's a, a, a bunch of the ones that you might find in your pocket and close to your home. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other ones. Now, if I, depending on the audience that I'm talking to, most of the audience has no idea, really, of the electronic systems which are in this category. These are the invisible ones. Uh, the stuff that is nevertheless kind of important, that, uh, you know, keyhole surgery and uh, security, automotive, health, uh, robotics, air transport, energy... Uh, even things like the congestion charge, and I, I like the cup of tea at the bottom because that's actually a representative of the whole logistics associated with both the creation of the cup and the creation of the tea inside it, both the water and the heating and the logistics which will bring tea from remote parts of the world and bring it all there actually represents a, a, a pinnacle of achievement which is now supported by electronic systems. So the, the invisible electronic systems are a very significant part of, of, um, of our lives and yet we don't really see them. Um, what we've actually been doing though is bringing embedded intelligence to the consumer market. And that's had a huge change on what it means to be uh, involved in computing these days. Because as long as the computer lived in a computer room then you could actually you could look at it as an entity. Computation was something that went on in that space. But now computation is increasingly going on in your watch, in your pockets, in your camera, uh, and in the environment. And that, that is an, a, a, an evolution, a revolution, which is quite significant. Now that, of course, has happened up until this point. And around 10 billion, or the, the order of tens of billions of units, are out there in the world of this kind of classic uh, computation and all of the uh, indicators say that we're heading towards the Internet of Things, the, that everything increasingly will be connected to everything else and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's one big data pool in which they're all swimming, it just means to say that nothing is isolated anymore. So you can link things and you can link things together and, uh, and deduce things from the, from the environment in such a way that, they, uh, that it hasn't been traditionally possible. One of the things that that will of course do though is it's going to take the tens of billions of units into the hundreds of billions of units. So it's not just, con it's not just the consumer uh, whose uh, who's, um, drives for imp improved performance. It will also be the, uh, the presence of these, these devices which are just literally uh, capable of monitoring anything. So you will, you will get a text which tells you that your toast is done. It will happen. Um, the other thing to, to bear in mind is that it says old drivers don't go away. Because there is a tendency to think that it's only up that curve is the thing that you need to worry about. But actually, you know, there is still mainframes out there. They're just not the dominant effect anymore. They're not, they're not leading what, what computation is. But they're still there and they're still doing their, their important roles. And their quantity hasn't radically changed from what it was in the earlier days. It's a bit of an alarming thing to discover that 2% of our energy usage goes on compu computing and electronics today. That's a large number, which if you consider that uh, the Internet of Things is aiming at raising the quantity, certainly by an order of magnitude, rather more than that. If we're not very careful, then we could, could be looking at an energy consumption in this whole sector, which is the order of 20%, which is amongst, amongst the biggest categories of energy usage. So a casual approach to energy could give us a serious energy problem, apart from anything else. 
Now, put some scale on this thing, ARM in its digital world, we do know so far in our life that we've shipped 40 billion CPUs. Um, that's five and a bit for every person in the world already. We know equally reliably, this is based on our measurements, so this is not the market measurements as a whole, this is just uh, ARM's perspective. We do, we do see reliable routes for 150 billion of those by the, by the uh, year 2020. So that's not 150 billion a year, that's, a, that's the cumulative total by that time. We also have uh, some more recent statistics. We shipped 8.7 billion of them last year. These are very large numbers. It's something like 52 million a day. Very, very large numbers. And also, thanks to Gartner, we discovered that 75% of the things that are connected to the internet are ARM powered, which is a staggering thing because the internet has suddenly become our major sales vehicle. We're a little company in, uh, in the UK. Now, of course, we know that Moore's law is, is behind all of this, um, but it's sometimes very... Um, not inconvenient, it's sometimes, uh, we tend to, we're so close to it that we sometimes forget what it really means. But I'll give you a, a touch of context. ARM was formed in 1991, and at that time we were designing uh, integrated circuits with around a million transistors on it, and it seemed a lot. We're now looking at being able to get 20 billion transistors for a fiver. Um, that's a lot of scale improvement. In fact, it's more than 20,000 times. The, uh, the, the capacity of that silicon product in the uh, 22 years, I think it is, since we, since we formed. Um, now that, 20,000 times, it's like Gordon Moore in 1968, I think it was, when he made his famous prediction. He had been designing an integrated circuit with eight transistors on it, and he'd seen one that followed that with 16. He was currently involved in a design which had 50. So if we want to look at the, uh, the multiplication factor since 1968, then we're looking at something which is half to a billion times more capacity. Now that's a staggering thing, because it means that at least part of what we've been doing in the meantime is actually struggling to, to achieve the necessary increases in productivity. We've not given power a thought, because for so much of its life, CMOS was considered to be a zero power logic technology. It's only in, in rate later years that it became an issue. So when we look then at uh, high performance computing, does something like this or represent the uh, pinnacle of computing? Or something like that? Or indeed something like that? Because I think that uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one to put your finger on. But if you look, stand back a little bit and say, well, what's, what is computing? Well, computing, at least conceptually, and I don't need to express this to you, is really just solving the equation. Uh, the equation may have time and state involved in it, and in fact, increasingly they do, even though it may not always be important factors. Um, and the, essentially, the equations they're solving are things which are important to humans. So we're modeling some sort of real situation. It might be a diary, it might be a word processor, it might be a flight requirement. We're, they're all models. We're expressing that model uh, through an analogy, and the analogy um, is, is, is unimportant about which particular technology, or whether it's done in hardware or software, or what energy is taken by it. The act of computation is nothing to do with that. So you wouldn't be surprised then, I suppose, to find that the first... Uh, generally, first computer is recognized as being the Antikythera, which is uh, 87 BC, which is going back some, we've got to admit it, but it was aimed at computing the position of the stars. It was something that mattered to the people in those times. Um, it wasn't really a consumer product. Uh, as far as uh, can be found out, there was probably eight or ten of these things in existence, and they were created very laboriously in a time when really materials, the availability of materials and the technologies to work them were very poor indeed. Uh, probably it's the turn of the Industrial Revolution, 17, 1750, where that became something of a slightly more commoditized product, but still computing the same uh, requirement. Now, of course, Babbage produced his, fav his uh, famous difference engine. Um, now, of course, perhaps not so important to these days engineers as it was when I was a, a junior, but I have my log tables 
and I had to use them when I was doing complex calculations. And log tables just make multiplying and dividing so much easier. And, uh, and Babbage's machine was about producing tables. Uh, the way that it was done beforehand with a lo was a lot of ladies in a room, and I'm sorry to, to be sexist, they were generally ladies in a room, who were calculating the uh, individual exponent values for lots and lots and lots of the um, elements of, a of these log tables. Uh, they were called computers, incidentally. And of course, Babbage's difference engine had one slight difference. And I think, I'm not sure whether that's why they called it the difference engine, but that was the, uh, the mechanical technology of its day wasn't up to making it. So here was a computer that would compute, but actually the technology to support it wasn't there. Of course, there's Enigma. Enigma was a, an electromechanical machine, and it was actually doing uh, encryption, decryption. And, of course, you then started to see the first in inroads of electronics data with uh, Colossus, which was intended to do the opposite part of this, decoding predominantly. Um, Val's mechanical technology were ways of implementing the different computations involved, clearly. Uh, it's interesting to note, actually, that the reel-to-reel the -reel thing over the, on the right-hand side is a memory. Uh, so we were not up to storing great quantities of memory in those days, data in those days. Baby, the first general purpose computer, valves and technology, and then the analog computer. Although most people don't tend to think of the radio as a computer, but it is. It uh, doesn't matter which area you're looking at, it's a series of equations. They're, uh, they're modeling, they're transferring, first of all, the RF signal from the air into a voltage, so there's an analog, and then you're processing the voltage through various um, equations. Not surprisingly, then, there are ways of implementing it. And uh, with the attraction of using Val, uh, a radio as, as a model is that there have been various instances of radio, starting from the early crystal set, which I didn't uh, elaborate on. But here, a block diagram of a valve implementation, a transistor implementation, and not surprisingly, they are processing those equations. Not accurately, but accurately enough. If the output isn't quite loud enough, then you turn the volume up a little bit. If it's not in tune, then you tune it in a little bit. It's, not, it's adequate for the purpose. Of course, a modern integrated circuit technology gives you a radio which is, let's say, infinitely more controllable, but my seven transistor radio that I had that I was very proud of, because it has two more transistors than my friends who only had five transistor radios, uh, the number of transistors in this radio is probably measured in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Uh, the other interesting thing that goes on, though, is what's inside there has ceased to be important as well. Because you don't know whether it's analog or digital inside that box. You only know that there's an analog signal that goes in and an analog signal that comes out. So the actual technology I've had to put down as integrated circuit because I frankly haven't got a clue what's inside it. So we see that the pinnacle then is application related and it's also era related. Now, if you, if you think then that computing is in many respects an overhyped title, it is really just creating output from input. And architecture is probably the biggest, most significant factor in all of this because it's the way, it's the most important way that, that determines how a product is put together. And you've got hardware, software, analog, optics, graphene, mechanics, steam, wood, any, te any technology which is available to you, because as an engineer, your role in life is to create a solution, the most effective solution at any particular time, using the tools and the technologies which are available to you. And functionality is kind of implicit. If you make a saw that doesn't saw, then you've failed on the first hurdle. If you make a saw which saws and it's a better saw than somebody else's saw, then you sell more of your saws. It's a more su successful product. And so architecture is probably one of the most undersold but actually most important features of any, of any applications and certainly computer-related applications. So computation in a cool icon then. There's a lot of cool stuff in a smartphone. I mean, you look at them and they're pretty amazing. They do an awful lot of things. The interface is very slick. Uh, but the, if, you, if you look below the skin, that's a block diagram and I wasn't intending you to be able to read the words on it. You can go that way and have a look at it if you want. But what I want to show here is how many different forms of computation there are in a product like this. Because Joe Public in the street really has no concept that there is even an inside to an iPhone. 
And what you know is that there is some stuff in there. But I think even most technologies don't, technologists don't realise how much stuff is in there. The general impression is a smartphone is one chip. Reality is actually quite a lot different. A smartphone is about 20 chips. And if you look here, then you see we've got a good mix of technology. Non-volatile MOS, by CMOS, memory MOS, saw filters, analog CMOS. You've got a whole series of technologies associated with what I would call roughly at this stage software. But they're, they're only ways of addressing the, uh, the technical challenges which are, in, which are required uh, to, be, to be able to deliver a, a smart electronic product such as this. The board is double-sided. Hey, that's quite a challenge in itself, actually. We're not even going to go into the, uh, uh, the other technical technologies which are inside the smartphone, but have you ever thought, how do they assemble a board with components on both sides without the ones on the other side falling off? Um, maybe it's easy, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, but here we've got uh, digital CMOS, we've got memory MOS, analog CMOS, analog bipolar, analog gallium arsenide. Uh, and th there is also the, uh, on the other side, I don't know whether I highlighted it or not, there was the surface acoustic wave filter. So there's a lot of technologies in there, and not all of them are digital. And indeed, the digital MOS, the A4 processor, is the one, if you like, which carries the fame. That's the one which everybody thinks of as being the challenge inside this. But all of those computations, all of those block, all of the objects inside the block diagram, have to have computation associated with them, and these are the architectures which are part of the decision which has made what I think everybody must realise a successful product. Now that's the that's the deciding factor on here, because you see, and that architecture is not what you want to produce, as in something exciting. It's what the customer wants to buy because those are the ones that make genuine business sense. Inside the, um, the processor, well this is not the A4 processor, this is a Tegra 3, uh, but just to illustrate, here we've got uh, actually six ARM cores, five of them in the middle and one which is hidden just up there to the, to the left. But it's an illustration, I think, of uh, just what, what goes on in a billion transistors. I mean. It's a, a chip. Most people would look at the chip and they'd see the same chip as they saw 15 years ago. It's an area of silicon and they can't really see what's on it. Uh, maybe tilt it in the light, it actually has a little bit of colour reflection on it. But actually it's when you realise that if you pour down on this big one, down and down and down, you ultimately get to real transistors. And at that diagram, at that scale, we're talking about the, the routing that's necessary to connect up three of those billion transistors. You can imagine how the scale of that representing a design challenge, uh, not surprisingly um, one that uh, has been interesting to us. <coughs> so anyway, architecting your product then. Architecture, like this wonderful cathedral which is next door, fantastic thing to look at this, the architecture and say, Gosh, they did that using technology, stone technology, using mathematics which in these days are incredibly primitive. And they, they calculated it all and they made it work. Well, of course, the other thing that you don't know is anybody been to Malmesbury? Malmesbury has a cathedral which fell down. Uh, and the bit that's left is actually something like a fifth of the original cathedral. So it's a, the, the thing that makes architecture successful are the ones that survive because all of the other ones fall down, they don't, they don't exist in, in history. So it's the, the good architecture choices that went into the iPhone are supported by the bad architecture choices which went into all of the other products which are not here today. So history is written by the winners and on the subject of that the industry uh, uh, position on this one is second is for losers. You never aim at being second, you've got to aim at being first. So you've got to think system as well. There's no point in thinking of the performance of a component of the system in isolation because it's the system that people buy. They either buy or they rent or they procure or whatever, but it's the system performance in a human context that people use and therefore it's the consideration of the performance of the whole which is, which is much more important than the performance of the part. Now in the market we've got architectural options, we've got business model, time to market and aesthetics. Not much technology in any of those, but actually they're very important. And getting something out is important, and that depends on what you know as much as anything else. 
So if you've got a team which is available, a software team, then you're inclined to say, I'll do this function in software. Not because it's the best architectural decision, but because I've got a team that's available to do, to do that work. If I've already got a chip which is three quarters of the way to doing what I need to do, and I'm going to put a little bit of extra work into it to, to make it do exactly what I want to do, then that becomes the architectural choice that you, you undertake. Now, of course, some of the results that you, uh, you come out with will have three heads and 49 legs and will fail, but others will succeed. There's a lot of people out there trying. Technologically, today we have a very rich environment. Analog, digital, mechanical, optical, RF, software, plastics, metal forming, manufacturing, glass. Really not very fashionable to talk about glass and metal and plastic as part of the product, but it is. You can do things today with a smartphone that you couldn't have done only a few years ago because the metal handling processes are not available only a few years ago. So technology has advanced in all of these things. <coughs> And it's interesting to bear in mind that reuse, because, again, it's not emphasized, but reuse is more than 99% of a product. What you're doing today is largely based on what you did before. Uh, it's very few people get the opportunity of doing a clean sheet anything, especially in business. It's always evolve, 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 evolve. Oh, and functionality is assumed. Well, if it doesn't work, it doesn't get on the shelf, end of story. It's only when it's on the shelf that it's in a competitive position. So you never get rewarded for delivering functionality. That's part of your job. So power philosophy then. Um, this is a philosophy which I've extracted out of ARM's history. Um, we don't have it neatly described. It's not on a poster on the wall or anything like that. Uh, but nevertheless is, is, is what we have done. And it's part of... Um, our history is part of our concerns all of the time. It's hardware that dissipates the power. And I think this is one of, the, one of the problems that the software world has had, is that software is not associated with hardware. It's not really associated with power, therefore, or anything physical. It just is. But hardware, of course, is the thing that gets warm. It's like, but it's also the thing that you pick up, and it's also the thing that you buy. So, uh, you know, that's why software has no value, and hardware has value. But actually... Chips aren't what people buy, it's the physical pa package that people buy. Um, <clears throat> you've got to choose an underlying technology for the best power efficiency. And you've got to recognize that one size does not fit all. These are um, uh, specific instances which came to us out of our history of uh, embedded system developments. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's true for, for systems in the wider context as well. So software tells chips to do stuff, and it can tell chips today to melt chips. Sorry, it can tell chips to melt themselves. Um, certainly, silicon is well capable of, uh, of overheating in a destructive way these days, if you turn everything on, if you run everything at full speed. And so already software has to be aware of that in these embedded environments. And that doesn't necessarily amount to power philosophy, but it is certainly one of those things. Um, the other thing is to make hardware as power activity dependent as possible. Now, it may seem um, a little bit of a counterintuitive thing, but if you can make your, uh, uh, your hardware only consume power when it's doing something, then the corollary is it doesn't consume any power when it's not doing anything. And that's actually a very useful uh, state, especially in an embedded activity, because all the time that it's not doing anything, it's not wasting power. Now, clearly, you want to make it efficient hardware to start with, but add it to that, you now have to starting to make something which is really useful. And if you're going to make um, power efficiency savings wherever they are, then you've actually got to, to make sure that the, um, the, the, the parameter is measurable because you can't optimize something that you can't see. So you can make general improvements in software to, to make your uh, energy efficiency better, but you really don't know how much of an energy problem you've got until you start delivering measures of it. So again, our philosophy has got to be here. Make, uh, make the performance information available to the OS and to the, app, uh, and to the apps and the options that they've got for controlling that. That doesn't actually enforce any kind of control, but if they can't measure it, they can't do anything about it. At the bottom, you have one which is, which is becoming more important to us in a, a, a mobile system. It's certainly important when you move beyond the mobile system, and that is that moving data 
is a major energy consumer. It's becoming rapidly the energy consumer. Uh, cause energy is proportional to data, the quantity of volume, the speed that you shift it, and distance. And the only thing I can say about the distance is, it's certainly square law, it might actually be a cube law. It's steep. If you start to move large volumes of data any kind of distance, then you, uh, you're going to run into huge system energy cost. It may not be much cost to you and your smartphone, but it becomes part of that big environmental problem that we're building. Bring the process to the data. Hmm, interesting idea. Uh, but of course, one of the things that you, you gain energy efficiency here with things like caching, but not all caching. Right through caching is not good, but uh, right back caching is. Uh, so you have to, you're bringing the, the data to a process and then you don't move it anymore, you keep it there. But think system, it's how the, how the box performs, not how the components. So to look then at, um, at some of these things in an ARM context, uh, so we start with, we've got 24 processors here in six families and all of those have configuration options. This is addressing the first point on that line, namely make your, make your products energy efficient anyway. Now I say they, it's an easy thing to say, they are all ARM, all ARM processors are power efficient. It started off by accident, uh, nevertheless it is there. Uh, thumb instruction set when it was added halved the amount of uh, data accesses which were necessary to the, to the main memory. Not surprisingly then turned out to be an energy efficiency saving. Uh, we also had a conditional on every instruction in the early days that also turned out to be an energy efficient cycle. So these were, these were features which weren't particularly built in but did turn out to be features which came, uh, came, out, came to be valuable. These days we nevertheless do design our, all of our processes with energy efficiency in mind. So they are, very, they are very carefully focused on that. But the other thing is, with the 24 processors, what we're actually talking about is select your core so that it matches the application's need much more carefully. There's a lot of variation between the highest performance one with all of the uh, memory management and virtual memory uh, they, the, than there is on the, uh, the Cortex-M series, which are really rather uh, bare-bones bo processes, or indeed the secure core ones, which are so bare-bones that they go in smart cards. Um, but it does mean that the, as a philosophy, we have a range and we have to support that range. So just to give it some sort of scale, the range between the smallest core and the A15 is the, uh, it's a five times performance, but of course that's not strictly true because it's a totally different vehicle. This one has all of the memory, memory management and, uh, control and so on. But in terms of uh, the scale of uh, these implementations, the top ones are about 50 million transistors and the bottom one about 50,000. So it's a, uh, a thousand times smaller uh, implementation, not surprisingly then, if you're carrying 50 million transistors in an application that really doesn't need it, that's not a very power efficient solution. Now, of course, most people know uh, this little equation, uh, parallel is more efficient. Uh, in essence, if you can take a processor and if you can afford the, the silicon area, um, divide the processor in two, run it on a reduced voltage and at a reduced frequency, you end up with 40% of the power. Um, now, how far you can take this, depends on the war between Amdahl and Gustafsson. Um, Amdahl says that you can't really go very far. Uh, four, five, six is probably about the limit. But Amdahl takes the view that you're starting out with a piece of code which is essentially already written linear and you're trying to extract parallelism from it. Gustafsson, on the other hand, takes the other approach and, if, and says if you had a lot of cores, um, how could you apply your application to it? So it's a lot more in the case of uh, if you write it for parallel cores as opposed to extract parallelism from it. Gustafsson says the number can be very much higher, uh, hundreds or even, uh, even thousands, I guess. Um, nevertheless, it's an area which is not terribly well defined. Um, ARM has been working on this for some time without consciously thinking about it. Um, we've, we've had the, uh, the typical systems, I mean they, they weren't drawn as prettily as this when, when we did them, but uh, a Cortex um, A8, a Cortex M3 for power management application over here and a graphics processor in the middle is actually a parallel system, a heterogeneous multi-core system. Um, it was the starting point, I mean now we move to uh, 
clustered cores and uh, the A9 was the one at which we, we really started to have uh, multi-cores, although most of the, although it was possible to do up to 8 and 16 cores in a uh, coherent block, um, we actually found that most of our uh, customers, and they're the ones who ultimately choose the architectures, were only choosing two. Again, the problem here that they, were, they had Amdahl in their history. They needed to bring 90% of their code from their previous generation to their next, and the amount of parallelism they could easily extract from it was fairly limited. Uh, so two was about their limit. So we started to get this interesting collection of actually clusters of clusters. So although it was possible to go four and so on, uh, we were actually finding that the customers were asking for, for multiple clusters of two. Um, because they, uh, they, they had se several threads of software which were relatively uh, independent of one another and they were better mapped to this. Now we're starting to look at an architecture here which is, I think you'd describe as, let's say, novel. It's evolutionary. It's the situation that people have got themselves into which actually provide their next generation product specifications and the architectures, therefore, are the ones that emerge from that. So back in 2010, we were looking at a device like this, which is a real, a real device, and it's been uh, denuded from the, from the point of view of illustrating it. But here we had two clusters of two A9 processors, a, uh, a Mali 400 graphics processor, which actually is a modular process, processor itself. Um, and then there's a, there's a memory controller, which has another arm in it, and a, there's a power controller somewhere. Maybe it's not on that particular diagram. But there's you know, 10 processors in this system back in 2010. Um, and it's a, uh, you, you have to ask yourself in this one, you know, why, uh, why were they doing it this way? Shouldn't they do it another way? Shouldn't they have done it tidily? Well, the answer is uh, the silicon technology provides a billion transistors. Um, it's going to be supported by lots of memory externally to it, mostly externally to it, although there will be caches on board. Um, that's a huge potential that you can offer to a consumer as delivering some sort of real service. So the only thing you can do is, ARM gives technology in this context which allows people to fill up these chips with something which is going to be relatively productive. Uh, it gives them the time to market they want, it gives them the quality and the certainty they want, and the productivity is a major factor. So it's, it allows them to take a design that they previously had last, last year and move it to the next generation one. Reuse is a very big factor in all of this. Today, the core link has moved on a little bit from that, um, and this is a requirement driven by, again, customers' needs, but you're now looking at four clusters of quad, uh, four quad cut clusters of A15 processors. Scary! Uh, over here you've got DSP, uh, GP, GPUs, um, high performance links through smart memory controllers. I mean, these are scary systems. And yet, of course, these are the systems that people are building into the next generation of smartphones. You can't just create a system like that and say, here it is, here's the chip, go away, go and program it, because not surprisingly, the first th thing they come back with is, how the hell do you program this thing? So you have to have a methodology, because they're, they're going to build the, uh, the system into, the, in, into a chip with some of their own components. The methodology has got to start with the hardware, but it also has to extend to the software and to the uh, implementation issues. And the debug and trace there is an important part of this, because despite the idea that people think that they're perfect, most of them are not most of the time. Uh, interestingly there, I've highlighted a couple of extra things which have made an appearance in recent years, and that's the energy and trace modules. These are modules which are specifically aimed at allowing the application developer to look at the power consumption of this thing that he's creating. It's part of the debug environment, it's part of the trace environment, and the, the screens that, that you see which are looking not only at the logic functionality these days are also looking at the power dissipations of the various parts of it as well. So we have a range of power management um, tools available. Now, not all of these are available in the sense that you go to the ARM website and you can look and you can find them there and you can use them. But some of them turn out to be too, too complex to be really um, offered as a, uh, a utility to our, to our wider consumers. But some of them are. Uh, power management, this one is in part 
Uh, essentially aimed at the smaller systems, um, but they're also aimed at the peripherals which are around them. It's important that you turn off things which are not used. It's also important that you can reduce the voltage and reduce the frequency of some parts of it if you don't actually need, to op need them to operate at full speed all the time. Uh, now it turns out that the, uh, the, the switched um, the gating for the clocks and voltages are actually something which is fairly easy for us to support into the wide world. And the, um, uh, the, 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 delta, uh, the change in voltage and frequency is rather more complex, so we tend to use that more internally in our own designs rather than beyond. Um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, and I'll move on from that, because the next, next big one on that one, of course, is Big Little, which is really the same story. It's a case of why use one processor for all applications all of the time? Because if you can have a processor which is a, which is a power efficient one, not the highest performance, and you can have one which is a higher performance, not the power, most power efficient, then you can use the power, the power efficient one when you've only got light duties going on, and you can use the, uh, the, the, the more performance oriented one when you've got the more demanding applications going on emphasizing that relation of make sure that, you're, that when your system is off it's not consuming anything make the, make the system power consumption as load dependent as possible it sounds not a huge difference but if you look at the two little block diagrams at the right hand side which are there for, uh, to, to illustrate this point the difference that you get in multi-issue pipelines and complex out of order versus the very simplest implementation effectively of the same instruction set the same control set, um, gives you the, the, the fundamental difference between these two partners. And of course you can't do this in isolation, it has to be done in, in a, an environment which is supported by the software and we have two, uh, CPU migration and uh, big little multiprocessing. This one is perhaps the, uh, the, most, the most general case which is actually uh, aimed at the, uh, the, 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 the more specific application processor uh, domain, but the CPU migration one is aimed at the embedded processor domain, so associated with sophisticated uh, control systems on engine management and stability and so on. Now bringing the process to the data, another example here, um, this is a HP uh, Moonshot server, and here they've recognized basically that not all server applications are the same. And if you're only serving relatively simple web pages to lots of people, so if you're something like BBC serving iPlayers, then the load is going to vary hugely, and actually the amount of data which is shipped to a particular um, consumer is not all that great. And so it's, it lends itself very well to uh, multiple microservers, and it, uh, the energy efficiencies, at least that they claim, are pretty staggering, like 10% of the power of a dedicated system. Uh, of course, HP are not the only one. We now have Dell moving into that space, and uh, this Chinese company, Baidu, are actually building a great big uh, server, uh, a factory-sized server, if that's the right way of describing it, um, and that's based on their own uh, base rock server design using the, um, which processor was that? A Marvell processor. <clears throat> and then of course you've got the move for super, from supercomputers, from dedicated machines to the, uh, the use of multiple uh, smaller processors, essentially doing the, the third in, uh, exercise of refining data into information, so avoiding moving data and moving more information, pre-processing that information progressively. So how many lessons can be transferred to the GP software world? And I'm sorry to say, not that many. Moving data is power expensive. Um, mainly your big CPUs are not workload dependent. Uh, so they, they sit there consuming power whether they're doing something or not. And so the only thing you can do with your, uh, with your code is to get it in, get it done and get out. Because that's the more power efficient, most power efficient thing you can do and let somebody else get at it. Um, the other is a possibility of using a hypervisor and turning off at least some of the system which isn't in use. I don't think anybody's doing that at the moment, but that's really more of a server uh, domain activity rather than a software development activity. 
The other point that I'd like to, to bring in, and it's really heading towards my last slide anyway, so we shouldn't, we're not far away from that, that society's challenges in the 21st century, all of these things, energy is one of them. I said earlier we have to, to, have to watch out uh, for what the power consumption of the things that we're creating is, but actually the thing that we're doing is going to address all of those. What tends to be assumed by society, on the other hand, is we're going to solve these problems. What we're not going to do is we're not going to solve these problems. We're going to help with the solution of these problems. And as the society is actually creating these challenges, then one of the, it's very much in the hands of society to, to set about tackling them. Energy-efficient computing will help, but it's not going to solve the problem on its own. So, conclusions then. Putting the power of computation into the hands of the masses has changed computation again, it's changed the face of computation again. Uh, there have been changes in the past, it will happen again, but they are going to be there, they're a part of our lives and a part of our economy. Uh, power efficient electronic systems is a major issue to society which, which faces a future with it as a significant energy consumer. We've got to talk to society because it's causing the problems as much as it's solving them and it's causing the problems as much as we are capable of solving them. And I think that uh, part of the solutions in that area are going to have to involve uh, society. Power efficiency must be architected into the system hardware and software from the beginning. It's a, it's a tough one is this because of course we're inevitably surrounded by the environment that we're surrounded in. We also have our history and whatever code you're writing uh, for whatever purpose you're writing it, you're running it on a, hit, on a system which has been determined by history. Nevertheless, if we're going to make a difference, we have to make it a difference in a forward direction. So we have to strive to achieve the no work equals no power objective. We we have to uh, strive to make sure that the indicators and the levers are there with the hooks to allow the software to hook to it. And we have to remember that moving data is a disastrous thing to do. Let's start to move information and process it uh, as a way of avoiding that. So that's all. That ends my time. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you.